Members of the theatrical profession are notoriously so superstitious that many prefer to refer to Shakespeare's Macbeth as the Scottish play. This reticence does not extend to printing the name of the title character on posters. Perhaps because the play is both relatively short and a frequent examination text, it's one of the most performed of Shakespeare's plays around the country. A new RSC version opens in Stratford next month, and one comes to the Royal Lyceum in Edinburgh next week. And the current production at Theatre Clued in Wales was joined last night by a new production in Leeds. If it were done when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his surcease success, that but this blow, that but this blow might be the be all be and the end all here. here. But here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. Scenes from Jude Kelly's new staging of Macbeth at the West Yorkshire Playhouse in Leeds. And before that, the same lines from Terry Hans's new production of Macbeth at Theatre Cluid in Wales. Front Row brought together Hans and Kelly to discuss their approaches to directing this play. How, for example, had Jude Kelly dealt with the supernatural elements, such as the witch's predictions of Macbeth's destiny? What is interesting about the Weird Sisters, weird meaning prophetic as opposed to peculiar, is that they have a gift of prophecy. A gift of prophecy isn't something which we do find strange in society now. Police use mystics to solve crimes. They don't know why they use them, but they do use them. So I think we are still aware that there are peculiar psychic examples that we can't explain. And I think that Macbeth can't work as a play unless you accept that the paranormal is emanating from women who feel really strongly that they have information that they want to give to Macbeth and who are then scolded by Hecate for giving it to a man who's unable to cope with it. She then instructs them to give him information, psychic information, which will give him security and bring him to his downfall because he's become a tyrant. So, in a way, the paranormal, I think, is neither good nor bad. It's neutral. Terry Hans, on this question of the, the paranormal, where would you stand? I would prefer to call it supernatural, you know, in the sense that the play does examine what is natural, what is unnatural, and therefore, to some extent, what is supernatural. I, I agree with her that they're, in a sense, catalysts, that they uh, reflect uh, people's innermost thoughts. Uh, but I think they also have a reality. We know they existed in Elizabethan times, the witches. We know that, that you could go to the theatre and probably see the ashes of one still burning on your way in. They tell him uh, simple kind of gnomic things that always turn out right, but you always feel it's merely a trigger to something that he was already thinking in the first place. I think what's interesting about Macbeth is that the, the weird sisters, and Lady Macbeth, I think, to a large extent, suffer from a historical attitude where the women of th that were witches were persecuted for being strange and weird, but they weren't necessarily evil, but they became evil in society's minds, and that's why they were burned. But, well, gee, but there's also a question you have to address, which is Lady Macbeth, that she has become this archetype of the scheming mm. female, so that mm. Hillary Clinton, for example, is routinely compared to Lady Macbeth. Now, how do you, do you try to reclaim her for feminism or what? I mean, how do you deal with her? Well, it's nothing to do with reclaiming for feminism. I think it's fascinating that Lady Macbeth says very early on in the play, unsex me take my milk for gall. She requires the, the dark powers to turn her into somebody that she obviously isn't, otherwise she wouldn't have to call on them. And she mm. says, I would have, if he hadn't looked like my father, I would have murdered Duncan myself. She talks about the child that she's given suck to, that she loves. I think that she, she didn't have the idea either. I mean, the first person that suggests it is Macbeth. And she says, fine, we'll do it. She's no more scheming than he is. She might be initially more resolute to carry on with the deed but then finally much less prepared to go through with the f with the rest of the consequences of tyranny she draws back from murdering banco banquo and after that she really can't cope with any of the things that happen terry that, that the central marital relationship because people have often seen as i said of the, the wimp with the wife who has the backbone for both of them but how, how do you approach that 
it's quite clear from their scenes together that they have discussed the possibility that Macbeth, who was the finest warrior of the time, uh, it, could lay legitimate claim to it, and he's related to the royal family as well. And she says, you know, we've talked about this, and now you're dithering, now let's do it, and now is the moment. Um, I think it can be played very uh, delicately, but she unsexes herself in order to push through one moment, one deed. From then on, she's running downhill. It's not the tragedy of Lady Macbeth and Macbeth. It's the tragedy of Macbeth. When Shakespeare wanted to write about Antony and Cleopatra, he said so. I, I don't really agree with your analysis of the, you know, the title meaning it's not a tragedy for both of them because I think that if it grips you, it's because you know that not only is he capable of being king, but they themselves have potentially a fantastic relationship and when you see that relationship absolutely in despair and then in remnants you can't help surely Terry feeling that it's a tragedy for both of them there's one line where Duncan says your great love you know his great love uh, sent him on to, to and, and from then on she's pushing him and they and they never rule the country together ever um, the moment he becomes king, she's already being excluded. He has the murderers without talking to her. He bullies Banquo without telling her about that. Well, that's, that. that's what happened to Hillary Clinton, actually. They moved her out after the end of the first <laughs> term. But, Terry, uh, I just wanted to ask you, because a uh, preconception some people have about Shakespeare, particularly the mm. major tragedies, is that it's all good. Now, are there bits when directing it you rail against the author because it doesn't work or it's not good i remember a class of schoolboys groaning at the explanation of um was not a woman born when it turns out in the end because it didn't seem convincing are there bits like that that just irritate you as a director well, uh, I mean, that particular bit works, but I think it's a mangled text. We know that already. But there is some absolute junk in there. I mean... Give us an I, example of a bit of the junk, then, that's gone. I think the Hecate scenes were part of his original... Uh, which I'd cut, uh, were part of his original idea. I think they lost what he wrote, and somebody else wrote something in and hoped it would work. Now, you've kept those, Judah. Yeah, you? I have, and I don't, don't agree with you, Terry. I don't necessarily agree that it's not Shakespeare. The idea that she moves into these rhyming couplets and talks about meet me at the, the pit of Acheron. And my uh, little familiar spirit is waiting for me in a cloud. Well, I mean, we don't have any problem with any of that in Midsummer Night's Dream. I think it's only your preconception that Macbeth can't contain the idea of light spirits as well as dark spirits that makes us think, well, what is this Hecate nonsense? Mm. I actually think it's, it's very exciting and very driven and very theatrical. Jude Kelly and Terry Hands were discussing their new productions of Macbeth, running respectively at the West Yorkshire Playhouse in Leeds and Theatre Clwyd in Wales.